Well, amen. Church, do we serve a risen Savior? Is he alive? Is he powerful enough to change and transform not only our lives, but the, our loved ones' lives around us? Amen. We have great reason to be filled with hope and to rejoice. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6 as we continue our walk through the book of Ephesians. We spent these last several weeks walking through what's known as the household code. And if I could tell you honestly, as a pastor, there is a certain amount of my heart that hurts. As we talk about a godly wife, and as we talk about a godly husband, and as today we talk about godly children, because the truth of the matter is, is guys, we're dealing with the ideal. And as a pastor, I certainly know that many of you listen with cringing ears because of that loved one who is not walking with the Lord, who is not walking in a godly manner. So I don't want you to be discouraged. I don't want you to leave here any day and go, well, that's good for all those nice and neat Christians who have just everything figured out. But woe is me because my child isn't walking with the Lord. You see, the truth of the matter is, is Jesus knows exactly where you are. And he is the one who turns graves into gardens. He is the one who never stops moving, never stops redeeming. So don't you dare give up hope and don't you dare stop praying for your loved ones, okay? He knows exactly where you are. And his spirit will lift your head and encourage you and give you power and strength. Now let's reset the context because way back in chapter five of Ephesians, actually verse 21, uh, there was, there was this movement, this evidence of flow of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, way back in 521, is that there is this submission in the Christian's life, this ability to submit to authority. And then Paul immediately moves and goes into what we know as the household code. And we walk through, there was a certain pattern of wives submit to husbands, and then following, uh, th then there was an extended charge to husbands to love their wives, and then following the same pattern, children are addressed first, and then in the following week, we will address parents. Again, let me give you a definition. Submission is humble recognition of divine order. And today's passage will be armed at children. Now, the good news is every one of you is a child of some parent, so you don't have to quite tune out. I promise we will get to each and every one of us. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we continue to gather around your word, we we want and we need to hear from you. In our homes, we, we have repeatedly come to this idea that, that your Holy Spirit instills a submission and an obedience to authority in our lives that shines a light to the outside world that they will see you in us and especially in our homes. And this day, Father, as we focus on our homes and children in the homes, Father, just as a parent myself, can I just confess to you, 
how much I need your help, how much I need your strength, how much I need your wisdom in, in leading my family, how much I need your wisdom to know when, when to show grace and when to put my foot down and, and how to walk that line, how to continue to show my kids how much I love them, but to teach them to obey and to honor me as unto you. As grandparents all across this room and tuning in online, Father, I, I pray that you would help our home life to be filled with a certain amount of discipline that is honoring of you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. It was during the time of the judges when every man did what was right in his own eyes, that there was a man who knew God and walked with God. His name was Eli. And not only was he a priest, he was widely recognized as a prophet, one of whom God had given special favor you say, how much special favor did he have? Well, catch this. Eli was the high priest. That means that on the day of atonement, he was the only one in all of Israel who got to go behind the veil inside the Holy of Holies and bring the sacrifice unto God right there before uh, the, uh, the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant. But even furthermore, God had given Eli and his family a promise that his family would forevermore be right there in that tabernacle temple area, that he would always have priests serving in that line. Talk about favor. Yet if you know Eli's story, you know that it has a tragic ending. For all of Eli's good, he had an Achilles heel. He ignored the discipline of his sons. He had two reprobate sons, Hophni and Phinehas, served alongside him there in the tabernacle, and they were vile. 1 Samuel chapters 2 and 3 lay two gross charges against Eli's two sons. First of all, they were having relations with women right there at the tent. And second of all, they were stealing the choice meat that should have been reserved for God in the offering, and they were taking it for themselves. And in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, God revokes the promise that Eli's family would forevermore be a lineage of priests before him. He revoked the promise and replaced it with a curse. Why? Because God said, Eli, you knew and you did nothing about it. And so in one swift day, both of Eli's sons were killed in battle. The Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines, and when the news reached Eli, he was so shocked by it, he fell off of his seat and broke his neck. Furthermore, a few years later, Eli's descendants were slaughtered by Saul in the town of Nob as a fulfillment of this judgment. Now, I know that sounds harsh, but God places great responsibility on parents to discipline and shape their children. You say, Pastor, why are you starting here? This text actually addresses children. Well, you're right, and we will get to that, but we first must acknowledge that children begin in the home. They begin in the formative years, under the direction of their parents, and it is their parents' job to teach them to honor and obey them. And truth be told, the honor and obey is the hardest part of parenting, is it not? 
You say, Pastor Jason, what, you're, you're a parent. What, what's the hardest part? Being consistent towards my children. That's the hardest part of being a parent. Being consistent in my discipline. Because I say something and then the, uh, I say, all right, uh, this is the line. And then, and then they just want to get right up next to it. And then, and then they, wanna, they just want to cross over and say, what are you going to do now? And then they come right back and then, oh, right? It's just being consistent as a parent. You don't want to be heavy handed. You don't want to discipline your kids. And yet, truth be told, they need it. Let's pause for a second and let's ask an important question about the direction of our culture. Now, do not answer out loud, but you can shout in your mind if you want. Would you say that as a general trend, children are honoring and obeying their parents more or less? Who do we put that on? Is it not fair to say that our culture tends to put too much emphasis on children's feelings and boosting their self-esteem to the detriment of obedience and honor? Now, here's why this is so important. Because biblically, there is a direct tie between honoring and fearing your parents and fearing God. Check this out. Leviticus 19. It's on the screen here. Leviticus 19. Look at the first uh, verses 2 and 3 where you see uh, th that there is a command for everyone. Look at verse 3. Every one of you shall fear or have a reverence, that Hebrew word for fear there, it entails this reverence, this honor. Every one of you shall fear or reverence his father and mother, and you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord. And then drop down later in that very same chapter, the exact same word is used of fearing the Lord. Verse 14. You shall not curse a deaf man, nor place a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear or revere your God. I am the Lord. There is a direct tie between fearing and honoring and obeying parents to ultimately obeying the Lord. Let me piece something together. I'm going to move real fast, but I need to make this point because it is so profound. The Bible argues that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, meaning that the first primary main ingredient to begin to prepare the heart, to begin to be able to receive the gospel, the preparation of the heart so that you are ready to hear the good news of Jesus Christ begins with fear of the Lord. You see, the Bible says the fool has no fear of God. He does whatever his heart desires, thinking that judgment day will never come or that God will just willy-nilly forgive and forget everything. But that's not the gospel. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The Bible also has a repeated refrain, and that is this, that the voice of wisdom is continually crying out, calling to man's heart, calling if you would listen. Romans 1 and 2 says it like this, that God has placed an innate knowledge of himself inside of everyone, that all of creation speaks to the glory and the majesty and the power of God, and that every single one of us has a conscience built inside of us, and every one of us fail that conscience, okay? So the idea is that there are many voices calling out all around that you would fear God, making the heart ripe and ready to hear the gospel, and man is responsible to listen. And one of the primary voices prepping the heart is during the formative years as parents teach their children 
to honor and obey them because it's prepping the heart to ultimately have a fear of the Lord so that you can hear the gospel. It is so vital. It is so important. Culturally, we are so short-sighted. Acting like our kids are so fragile emotionally that we do not parent for the long term. Your job as a parent is to shape their hearts and their character not to be their best friend. So what's some practical help? Lane and I have found some amazing resources that will help along these lines. I want to point you to one book in particular titled uh, Have a New Kid by Friday, where the basic principle that Lane and I go back to over and over again is that you are to give your child natural consequences. Stop going around behind them and doing everything for them and cleaning up the mess. Rather, give them natural consequences. I'm going to give you a perfect example of this from my childhood That is, my mother used to do my laundry. She would uh, get it clean and get out all the stains and fold it, make it nice and neat and stick it on a nice pile on my bed. And then like every good mom would say, hey, before you go play with your friends, you need to clean your room. Well, there was a time where she found in the dirty laundry a pile of folded t-shirts that were still clean because my part of cleaning my room was to just oh it's so much easier instead of stick it in a drawer right I just pick all that up and stick it in the dirty clothes so she gave me one warning and she said if you do that again you're going to be doing your own laundry from now on well guess what happened (laughs) I did it again And from 11 on, I did my own laundry. Why? It was a natural consequence. I was a knucklehead, and I learned that my mom meant what she said. Now, there are tons of good resources that are available on parenting, and Karen and Will would love to be able to equip you. Reach out to those. Secondly, some practical advice Have regular meals around the dinner table together. That means turn off the TV, put away the cell phones, and talk. Did you know that only 30% of homes in today's age have regular meals together? Only 30%. That is a drastic shift down from just 20, 30 years ago, where it was over 66%. Why? Because we're too busy. We're distracted by so much stuff. But did you know if I could give you stats about children who have regular meals together with their parents as a family, they are absolutely staggering. Children are healthier physically. Why? Because they eat better. Okay? They get better grades in school. They have better social skills. They are far less likely to do risky behavior like drugs, sex, and alcohol. They are much happier, all of this statistically proven, in their mental health. And they have a far improved relationship with their parents. Did you actually know that 80% of teens say in a survey that they would like to sit down and regularly have meals with their family? So next time, as we walk through Ephesians, we'll look at verse four and we'll realize that there is a warning for parents. Do not provoke your children. It's the balance of this charge that I've been pressing you with. Yes, as a parent, it is your job to make sure they honor and obey you, but the balance will be do not provoke your children unto anger. So now let's shift and let's address the children. Basically, this passage is targeted towards those who are still in the home. That's the most natural context of the passage because fathers are immediately addressed about their discipline of their kids. 
Now, what's remarkable about this text is how much respect and dignity the Bible gives young children. When culturally, in biblical times, children were supposed to be barely seen and never heard. Do you remember when the disciples tried to block kids from coming to Jesus? Or uh, in the in the temple courtyard after Jesus' triumphal entry, when children began to sing and shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees were indignant because children were singing and saying such things. Well, see, in contrast to culture, Jesus welcomes children and their faith. The faith of a child is held up as a model of faith for us all. And here in the household code, children are given respect and dignity of being addressed. So if you are still in your parents' home, let me address you plainly. If you are old enough to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are old enough to be baptized, then you are old enough to listen to the direct charge of Scripture that is compelling you, and you're old enough to take ownership of your faith. So listen, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Guys, we are to obey our parents as a way of obeying God himself. That means humble yourself and show them honor. When you pretend like you can't hear your mom across the house, You are not obeying. When you do a halfway job of cleaning up your room, Jesus knows your heart. When you roll your eyes and mumble under your breath something about your parents, you are not honoring them. See, honor goes far beyond outward obedience. We've all heard the story of the, uh, of the young boy who, was, who unwillingly sat down because his mom told him to. He sat there with his arms crossed and he said to her, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. You know, parents love to share stories. And I had a buddy call me one day. He could not believe at the, uh, uh, at the audacity and entitlement of his son. So he told me this story. He said his son had gotten into trouble and his mom had sent him to his room for a couple hours. And a couple hours later, his, his wife goes to, to check on the son and doesn't hear anything inside, just sees that there is a note that has been slipped out from under the door. She reaches down, she picks it up, and the note says, I'm not talking to you, but I would like a hot dog for lunch. (laughs) I know we're holding up the ideal. Do you know what the last verse of the Old Testament is? Malachi chapter four, verses five and six. Listen to this. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's talking about when Jesus comes. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. A sign That Jesus has come, that the gospel permeates your home, a sign that you are saved, is a restoration of hearts between fathers and children. Back in Ephesians, Paul quotes the fifth commandment, and he points out that it is a commandment with a promise. 
so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. This is a general principle that explains God sees your obedience and honoring your parents. Listen, not every parent is the best parent. We all, there are different situations. They are all not equal, but God sees your honoring and obedience of your parents and God will give you favor. Why? Because parents have lived longer. They know more. And they genuinely want to pass that wisdom down to you. Scripture says the fool hates being corrected, but a wise man will receive instruction and love you for giving it to him. This past week, I came across a personal story that caused me to reflect greatly. There was a young man of Asian descent, and his parents were first-generation immigrants here to the United States, and they were poor genuinely poor. But the young man simply thought that his parents were overly stingy and refused to give him good things. As an adult, he confessed his bitterness of of many of the thoughts that he had as a teenager. And there was this one incident in particular that he was certain his parents had long forgotten, but he could never get over. His neighbor was selling a used Ford Mustang. And he really wanted it. And he had been working and saving his money and he scraped up as much money as he possibly could, but he was short. And he went to his parents. And his parents said, son, I'm sorry, we just don't have the money. And so the neighbor ended up selling the car to someone else and he kept the scar. It wasn't until adulthood that he realized his parents genuinely were very poor. And as he advanced in income, had a family of his own, they would gift his parents money around birthdays and anniversaries, just a little bit to try and help out. Now, his parents, being proud, tried to refuse it every time, but they insisted that they take the money. And then one day, his parents bought him a car. He would later learn that they saved all the money that he would gift to them, that they had been saving it up in order to buy him a car. When they tried to gift it to him, he tried to refuse. He said, Mom, you don't need to do this. I have enough money to buy myself a car. Why would you do this? And then simply said, because we remember whenever you were a teenager and we couldn't get you that Ford Mustang. I share that story with you because as children, we are often so short-sighted lost in our own world, have no clue about the genuine pressures and reality in everything that's going on in our parents' world, everything that they're going through. I've shared with you before, there was this, this, was this aha moment whenever I was, when Ian was an infant and I was up in the middle of the night trying to get him uh, fed and calmed down and all of those things, when suddenly, for the first time, it occurred to me, wait a second, My parents were here before with me. And I called them the next day and told them thank you. You see, evidence that we are filled with the Holy Spirit is a humility, a submission to divine order for you to honor and obey your parents. Now, as you age and leave the house, it begins to look different what it looks like to honor, different in the seasons of life. The obey part fades, but the honor never does. Love them, give them respect and consideration, especially in the latter years when health fades 
And they might need you the way that you once needed them. <clears throat> Jesus scorned a cultural tradition that had risen up during his time in Matthew chapter 15. It was called Corbin. It had become a common cultural practice of dedicating valuable material and resources to the temple. They allowed you to keep access of it during your lifetime, but because you had dedicated to it already, it would go to them at the end of your life. But because you had already dedicated it, you couldn't use those resources for something else. Well, what happened in Jesus' day is it became abused. Children were no longer caring for their aging parents. Instead, they were saying, the resources that we would have given to support you, we've already given them to God. And Jesus comes right at them. You've created pious little systems, rules that make it look like God is pleased, but you're neglecting something so basic as honoring your father and mother. Now, truth be told, there's so much complexity about caring for your aging parents. When to use a nursing home, when to bring in home health care. Every situation is different. But let this biblical truth shine through our homes because God knows our heart. Honor your father and mother. <clears throat> As I look back through my own upbringing, if I'm honest with you, I'm ashamed of my pride and lack of gratitude how I was so slow to realize all that my parents had sacrificed for me and for my siblings. That they were genuinely doing the best that they could and it took me so long to see it. There were key moments. Whenever I graduated high school, whenever I had children of my own, when I finally began to see it, I began to see things differently. It was during those moments that my siblings and I began to make a conscious effort that we wanted in a much deeper way to honor our parents. One of the things I'm most proud of is we had the opportunity to throw them a 40th wedding anniversary. We didn't quite think my father would make it till 50, and we were right. And we scraped up as much money as we could. It, it genuinely was, was not overly well done. It's as best we could do. It was pretty on the cheap, but it ended up being one of the most meaningful memories of my parents' entire life. My brother and I were also able to speak at my father's funeral, and that meant the world to me. When the time came, I had no clue if I would actually have the strength to be able to say anything God provided, you guys prayed, but I wanted to be able to stand up there and to honor him. My mom has entered into a challenging final season of life with certain difficulties settling in. So my siblings and I, we've gathered up, we've had some difficult conversations, but the truth of the matter is it's actually brought us all closer together. We are reminded that, that life is short and that doing everything that we can to honor the legacy of our parents is so vitally important. I share all of that with you. I know everyone in this room has a different circumstance, a different situation. And yet God's word is still true. Honor your father and mother. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this continual reflection all the way through different positions within the home. This continual refrain about how being filled with you is being filled with the Holy Spirit, 
means that we have this ability to, to submit and to honor, to give glory and honor where it is due, to trust certain authority that you have placed over our lives. Father, we pray for our homes, knowing the incredible difficulty, the complexity of raising children in 2021. Father, our, our culture is moving at such a fast pace. Parents don't feel like we can even keep up Father, we pray this truth becomes so en entrenched in our homes. That, that is that promise that you said at the end of Malachi chapter four. And that is that when Jesus comes, that the, the hearts of fathers will be turned, that there will be restoration towards children and children back to the parents. May that be our homes. May today be a catalyst of conversations, of looking at our children different, children looking at, at parents different. The restoration of our homes, keeping the family a priority. Father, we do confess how often we get busy, we get distracted. We allow even good things to pull our hearts away from ultimate priority. Forgive us, give us the strength to make correction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.